Okay, so the recording is up and going. Good morning to everybody in YouTube land, uh, or evening, or whatever time of day you're watching this in. Uh, here we are in January with the door open and 70 degree wow. weather. <laughs> so, yes. Not trying to gloat for people in other parts of the country, but uh, you know, Temple Israel is always accepting new members if you want to move down and enjoy the weather. <laughs> So we continue with Ediot uh, on Mishnah 310. Um, now, we had talked last uh, last week about Raman Gamliel uh, being um, strict, uh, like Beit Shammai. And this week, we are going to see the opposite, where he is going to be what is called lenient. Um, if you remember at the very end of our, our discussion last week, we had a... Um, a long examination of the way Judaism classically doesn't attach a value to being lenient or strict in and of itself, right? It's not like, ooh, those strict people, they're really good, or ooh, those lenient people, they're really good. It's you choose the right answer, the one based upon your knowledge, your understanding, your logic of the, of the tradition uh, in order to come to a conclusion. And whether you are lenient or strict in the end, is not a value judgment. And we're going to see that here because we have Ramon Gamliel, who was obviously a great, and in some things he was strict, in some things he was lenient, and being strict or lenient relative to the average of the sages doesn't make him better or worse in either direction. It just is the tradition or the reasoning that he had inherited or come to when he was trying to apply Jewish law. So. It's unfortunate, um, all because of things that happened in the 1800s, that we are now saddled with this weird cultural fetish of some people loving what's lenient and some people loving what's strict just by itself. But it is a, it's a it's a perversion, really, of, of the Jewish way. We are not supposed to love leniency or love strictness by itself. We are supposed to love Torah wherever it leads us. Um, okay, with that in mind. Mishnah 3, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, Mish, uh, chapter 3, Mishnah 11. <coughs> Excuse me. Rabban Gamliel declared three decisions of a lenient character. First, when they sweep up on a festival between the couches. Okay. Um, uh, my, my, my wife and I are recently re-watching uh, I, Claudius, which if you've never seen it, it's a great BBC production uh, of the Augustian uh, emperors of Rome and their family lives and all of the horror that went along with it. And it does make you wonder, how did these people ever conquer the world? Uh, but it's great because it depicts Roman living in, in a way that was very common in the land of Israel during the time uh, of the Mishnah. And when they talk about couches, they are not talking about our sofas. They are talking about where people would um, recline to eat. Uh, that was what we refer to when we talk about reclining at the Passover Seder. Um, and what it was is you would just lounge as you eat, and you had a little tray table next to you. You know those little TV trays that people have now to eat in front of the TV rather than at their kitchen table or dining room table? right? That's not new. Romans were using those a long time ago. Yeah. But of course the problem is bits are going to fall off the, the, the trays, right? While you're eating, you're making crumbs and you're making muck. Uh, and you might want to tidy up when you're done. Unlike us and unlike the Augustians, uh, the floors of most people's homes were not carpeted uh, and were not of, uh, of smooth, um, perfectly poured concrete or, or you know, perfect tile with flawless grout. Um, if you were lucky, you had stone. Most people just had dirt, uh, and, and I mean dirt, dirt, just you know, padded, bare dirt, and that was your floor. The problem was, if I forgot my floor, uh, I'm going to draw a little bit of a picture for this. Uh, this is a side view. All right, this is my floor, and there is a crack in my floor because, of course, there's going to be cracks in my floor. My floor is made of dirt, and dirt changes and moves and all of that. So if I'm sweeping up all my pieces, right, what happens? It goes in the crack. Now you might think, great, out of, the way. out of the way, right, it's perfect. And that's actually the problem, because when you fill up a crack, you've now done work. Right? You, you, you're doing bonnet, you're building on, on Shabbat or Yom Tov, right, because you are leveling out the floor. You're smoothing out the floor. Imagine every time you wipe the table, if you were doing it with sandpaper, so that you were making the table smoother each time. 
it, you're may look like you're cleaning up, but you're actually working. And so the rabbi said, no, 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 no. You're not allowed to sweep up these cracks because you may think you're sweeping up, but what you're actually doing is smoothing out. And, and that was not per permissive, permittable. Permittable? Per permitted. That was not allowed. That was not allowed. <laughs> I swear English is my native language. Uh, that was not allowed. But Rabban Gamliel said, it's OK. That would be OK. His opinion was this was incidental. Uh, and therefore, it wasn't a concern, and the, the, you could go ahead and, and tidy up as you needed to um, after your, your dinners. Questions? Comments? That's interesting. Yeah. Didn't they have a general rule about intent in work? Uh, yes. There, there is a general rule of if you are trying to do work, then it um, is more severe than if you're not. Uh, and sometimes the unintended or accidental consequences were not considered uh, important, um, which is why, for example, you can go walking out on the street and, and Shabbat and not have to worry about, am I spreading anything with my feet? Am I leaving behind footprints or things like that? Generally speaking, there are a few caveats. So most of the time we don't worry about the accidental consequences. But there is also a very important principle in Jewish law called psikresha, which means if there is an inevitable, predictable, and unavoidable consequence, then we often are more um, worried about causing that. Um, it's, it's just one of my favorite stories. So if you'll, if you'll indulge me, it's like one, a, a halakha of how you real, realize halakha made 2,000 years ago was in a very different culture. Um, so psikresha in, in Aramaic literally means to remove the head. Um, and the rest of the phrase is lo yamut, right? If you remove the head, won't it die? Uh, the question came that if the children wanted something to play with uh, on Shabbat, and you said, okay, I'll give you a ball to play with, and so you pulled off the head of a bird, um, so they would have something to play with, was that permitted? Yeah, I know, we're all going, oh my God, <laughs> right? You're gonna cut off the head of a chicken, uh, well, uh, other birds, uh, to let your kids have a toy? How many of you, raise your hands, would think that I wanna give my kids something to play with, how about the head of a dead animal, right? That, you know, 2000 years ago, that was pretty exciting, I'm sure. Um, and you know, now you had a little ball, you could do whatever you wanted with it. Okay, it was different 2000 years ago, but it is a beautiful graphic example for the halakha uh, of the argument was, well, I don't want to slaughter the animal. I don't want the animal to die. I just want a ball. So the death of the animal is not my intention. It is incidental. And if I could avoid it, I would. If I could just magically pull the head off and not kill it, I would be happy. Collateral damage. And collateral damage, exactly. And the answer from Halakha is, <laughs> you, 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 there, there is accidental collateral damage, and then there is pulling the head off a chicken, right? <laughs> which is not collateral damage. That is first order. Foreseeable. Of course it's going to happen. It's foreseeable, right? So that became a, a, a byword, a, a legal term that was used in other halakhic arguments where people would try to say, but I didn't mean to. And the answer was, <laughs> like, well, I don't care whether you meant to, it was obvious it would happen. Uh, and, and so that means that there are some things on Shabbat that even if we don't mean for it to be work, we still have to avoid because it's obviously going to happen. Um, and, and so, you know, that 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 becomes an issue uh, for, for this case. But that's a direct cause, though. I mean, obviously sweeping is not necessarily, I don't know how popular these cracks are. Uh, but. Standard. I mean, that, that was what floors were constantly like. I mean, and, and you would constantly be doing maintenance to smooth out your floor if you were a good homeowner. Um, you know, the same way that in the modern world, we might say cleaning your gutters is, is the kind of thing that somebody who's a good homeowner will keep their gutters clean, blah, blah, blah. Back then, you would always be sweeping your floor because it was just dirt and you wanted to keep it smooth and nice and clean. And, and that was essential, you know, daily activity. So... Yeah, th this was an inevitable act uh, inevitable consequence of sweeping up. He just felt it was not significant enough to be worried about. But again, he loses the argument. But Ediot isn't here to tell us who, um, who was right or why. It's here to re remind us and protect the transmission of minority opinions as well as majority opinions. Good? Good. Second sentence. Second sentence. <laughs> Rabbi Gamliel permitted you to put spices on the coals on a festival. All right, so as I think we've mentioned before, um, 
there is a slight difference in laws between Shabbat and Yom Tov and festivals. Uh, most importantly, the differences revolve around food. Uh, now, specifically, it, it says that you are allowed to prepare what you, the nefesh needs, what the, the body needs or what the soul needs. And generally speaking, that is read to mean food. Um, so you're allowed to cook on festivals. You're not allowed to cook on Shabbat. Uh, we talked a little bit before about cooking on festivals for Shabbat, but this is talking about just the day by itself. Rabban Gamliel, his argument was that putting um, spices on coals, which was a way of creating an aromatic um, mist, um, in modern terms, we call it like incense or potpourri or um, what do they call that? Um, oh, yeah. Those vapor nebulizers. Oh, they have a, uh, the essential oil thing where they, they vaporize, they burn oils, diffuser. Exactly, exactly. So that would be similar in the modern world. You know, are you allowed to put on your essential oil diffuser on Shabbat, knowing that the, or on Yom Tov, sorry, knowing that the drops are going to fall down onto the hot element and basically be turned to steam. Um, they'll be vaporized by the heat. That's kind of like cooking, which is why he says it's okay. But it's also kind of not cooking, um, which is why the sages say, no, that that is not what the average person needs for a day. Right? Yes, you, Raman Gamliel, Mr. Hai Makini Mak, for you having beautiful scented home, that may be normal for you. And that may be something that for Yom Tov, if you don't have it, would feel like a huge loss. For the rest of us poor schlubs, um, we, we, we were lucky if our house doesn't smell like an open sewer because of what it was like in the ancient world. So we're not expecting fragrant um, spices on coals. So the rabbis forbid, he permitted. Make sense? Okay. And part three. Uh, Rabbi Gam Rabban Gamliel would permit roasting a kid whole on the night of Passover but the sages forbid it. Right, we're forbid all three. All right, they, all they, three right. of them. I, I sort of had to point out that the sages forbid, forbade all of these, but um, this last one, again, we're talking about a kid meaning baby goat. We're not talking about a kid yeah. meaning a child. Obviously, that would always be prohibited on any day. Um, <laughs> so what is the issue here? This one you might be able to guess. All right, it's not nothing to do with cooking, nothing to do with Shabbos oh. practice. You might think it's uh, the sacrifice of the temple. Exactly. That's what we would sacrifice on Passover. Right. Oh. What, what, what were we supposed to be eating on Passover? The, the Passover sacrifice, the yeah. right? The, the, the special sacrifice that would be taken to the temple. It'd be prepared there and then brought home. You'd cook it. You'd eat it on Passover night. He said, well, just because we don't have the sacrifices anymore, remember he lives in a post-temple time, doesn't mean we can't eat the baby goats like we used to and serve them in a way that looks even similar to the way the Passover sacrifice was, was done and cooked in a way that was similar to the way the Passover sacrifice was cooked. And the other sages went, no, 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 no. <laughs> that really, really looks like you're doing the sacrifice just without the altar. And, and, and doing a fake sacrifice is, is a big no-no. Um, so even though you're not actually doing a fake sacrifice, it's gonna look like one on your table. So eh, we don't do that. This is actually something that's a d difference between Sephardic and Ashkenazic communities and Mizrahi communities. Um, the Ashkenazim do not serve lamb uh, on Passover at all. It's just off the menu in almost all Ashkenazi uh, communities. And in many Sephardi and Mizrahi communities, having lamb is fine, but they're not gonna roast it whole and plump, plump it on the table. Um, they, they may have pieces of lamb, lamb stew, that kind of thing, but they're not going to serve a whole roasted lamb, usually. Remember, some communities always have some variety, but generally speaking, that is not what uh, what we do. Um, as I've taught my children, when something looks wrong, it's wrong. Like, for instance, Rabbi Neely cannot go into McDonald's to make a phone call. He can't, because if I see him going to McDonald's, I'll think, hey, I could eat there. So because it looks wrong, even though it's not a thing there, you can't, you can't do that because it looks wrong and may therefore teach people the wrong thing to do. Honestly. Right, although I should point out that that, that doesn't apply just to me. Uh, no, it does not. <laughs> No. Right. It's, it's not only Rabbi Neely who can't go to the strip club. Right? <laughs> no one can go to the strip club. 
because oh, we'll all assume that they're up to something inside there. They're not going in to make a phone call. Well, but if you go in as the rabbi, I might think that it's okay. If I see one of my friends go in, I know they're not that kosher anyway. So, yeah, but what about if you go to the bathroom? Yeah, yeah you must go. That's you are a, doing right. So uh, sometimes you need to go to the No, not McDonald's. Well, no, if you have, if no, you have, no, a, no, if you if you have no choice, so it's a it's a. Right, so there is a very, hold on a second. So the time does bring a very interesting uh, counter. So so first of all, we should point out, nobody makes phone calls at McDonald's anymore. We all have cell phones. Uh, <laughs> back in the day of pay phones, that was a different issue, right? But the question of a bathroom is actually a, a more acute one um, because if there was an alternative, then certainly we would not go into a, um, a place where it could be easily assumed that we might be transgressing a mitzvah. Again, strip clubs right out. Um, but for McDonald's, because of the question of kavod habriot, the, the dignity of, of, of being a human being, um, absolutely, if it's between that and I mean, messing your pants, you, you go in and you use their bathroom. Uh, I don't know what McDonald's will say about that because maybe they have a policy that you have to buy something. I don't know. But, uh, but as far as uh, whether or not you can use it rather than soil yourself, then certainly uh, you are allowed to use it. And, and if you are doing a striptease in a, in a neighborhood that is everything closed, it's in the middle of the night, you don't have any restaurant, nothing right. open, only a striptease club. <laughs> <laughs> so you only have to go and you do your fun. Hold on, wait a second. Natan, Natan, what are you doing in a neighborhood yeah. where everything is closed yeah, except the strip club? We are going to visit our friend. Your friend lives in the neighborhood. So so worst comes to worst, you find a dark alley or a bush. Yes. <laughs> That's right. Either there, 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 there should be. Now if you have a medical condition and you need to, then by all means work it out between you and, and, and what is your own personal medical needs. You know, if you have a catheter and you need to use a facility, whatever. <laughs> but so if in, you are in, doing it in, in the on the walk in the wall, okay, and the police stop you, say, "Hey, my rabbi, rabbi say I can't do this in the wall." You know, <laughs> as, as my grandmother may she rest in peace used to say, "If you're staying out past midnight, yeah, you're making your own fun, and, and, and that's when it's dangerous." <laughs> She's like, everything that's legitimate is closed. <laughs> okay, so yes, that uh, sometimes Marit Ayn as a principle, the, uh, actually it's, it's, it's an important point because it gets used a lot, right? The, 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 the technical term for what you're concerned with is called Marit Ayn, the appearance to the eye. Um, and officially that has a legal standing only in cases that were mentioned by the rabbis in the Mishnah and the Talmud. Uh, so the, 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 the most famous example of that is the eating of poultry together with dairy. Um, that we are not allowed to do that, even though, of course, by the Torah's definition of what is meat and what is milk, there should be no problem. Because of how it appears, then we have taken on a uh, offense, a protection, to, to not eat poultry together with dairy. Um, if, if you want to know more about that, you can check my last class on Kashrut for the Pathways to Judaism, where I pointed out that what poultry used to look like and what meat, standard meat used to look like was much more similar to themselves than what beef and chicken look like compared in the modern world. So this was a much more relevant and, and very important distinction. And it was really easy to get confused between the two. And so Marit Ayn was officially imposed as saying, we don't do it because it will give the impression it will mislead and others will come to transgress. In the modern world, Marit Ayn has only a soft connotation. That is to say, it is not a legally binding rule that can be invented just because somebody comes up with a, a concern about an, about an issue. So for example, um, I am more than happy to have my, my lovely fried chicken sandwich at home with big strips of beef fry on it, even though to an untrained eye, it looks like strips of bacon. Right? I don't know if you guys have ever seen beef fry. It, it's part of the, the, the cut of a cow and, and it is kosher uh, and you can you cook it in the uh, the oven and it really looks like cooked bacon. Um, and it tastes a little similar, remembering from my youthful days of, uh, of indiscretion before I kept kosher. Uh, it tastes similar and it certainly has a very similar texture. Um, it's, it's very nice. You can get it at the Winn-Dixie in Fern Park. Um, I don't have stock in it, it's okay. Uh, but that cannot be prohibited by Marit Ayn. 
Someone could argue you shouldn't do it because it gives the wrong impression, but it cannot be categorically prohibited. We're not allowed to impose Marit Ayin as a legal category to anything that the rabbis did not put Marit Ayin as a legal category on. We can only use it as advice. So the, the idea of going into a McDonald's is a, is a soft Marit Ayin prohibition, which is why for other reasons, it certainly is permiss permissible. You know, you gotta change your baby's diaper or something. Um, but uh, if, if not for this, there would be no way for bacos to be kosher, um, which if you've ever gone and looked at the little, you know, bacon bit things that you mm -hmm. can put in your salad, they're heck shirt. Um, I believe it's OU. Um, of course, because they're not made from bacon. They're made from soy and artificial flavoring. They're, they're probably not very healthy, I don't know, but they're definitely kosher uh, and they're definitely uh, stamped. And, and so too, you can find um, fake crab and fake shrimp that um, is hexured and absolutely kosher. And some the fake shrimp even is curved, look like a little bit of like a shrimp, absolutely kosher, no problem. Someone could argue you shouldn't be eating it because it gives the wrong impression, but that's only an argument. It, it's not a legally binding edict um, because Marit Ayn is not used um, because it would be too much of a loaded gun. Because, um, well, it looks like you, it looks like you, it looks like you, pretty much you're not able to do anything except like eat things with labels hanging off of them or do other activities. Make sense? Right. And, and, and yes, if you're a tax collector or if you're a police officer, you can still go to the strip club for legitimate reasons. You know, you need to in inspect their liquor license. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was just here to inspect the health, health violations. <laughs> okay. Uh, that is 311. <laughs> 312. Uh, okay. Uh, Rabbi Eliezer ben Azaria allows three things, and the sages forbid them. All right. So, again, same type of setup um, of the one rabbi permits, the other majorities do, do not. One, his cow used to go out with the strap which she had between her horns. Okay, so on festivals and also on Shabbat, of course, not only do we rest, but also our animals rest, which means we don't load them up with burdens. The question is, if I've got my cow, that's a cow, um, can I hang a little decorative strap between the horns? Is that decorating the cow or is that making the cow carry something? Right? Is it a, um, a embellishment for the cow, or is it me making the cow do work by putting something on it that it now has to carry? And remember, we don't define work in Jewish law by how many uh, calories the cow has to burn. So it doesn't matter whether this weighs three ounces or weighs 200 pounds. It's just the question of whether it falls into the category of work or not work. And the sages say work. Right, that this is not something we're going to allow, uh, and, and not just for for your cow, but no one's cow. And Rabbi Elazaria said, "No, it's fine. Right? This, this is not considered work. This this is just a inconsequential embellishment uh, of the cow." So, what do the sages thought of this work? Yeah, why did they? Think oh, it's because they're carrying, right? And 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 also because they believed in this is all another place where they do cite Maridain which is if you your cow goes out with something between its horns, someone else is going to think it's okay for the cows to carry things between their horns on Shabbos. And they may not just do a little strap, they may put, you know, firewood uh, or, you know, bundles of other things up there. So they, they do cite Maridain as a concern here that this is going to give an, a, a false impression uh, that will lead others to, to transgression. But didn't, wasn't there a, a thing where Hillel tied a knife to the cattle one time to carry it to the temple or something? I don't know that off the top of my head. Uh, th there are some... It might have been a festival day. Let's well, say maybe. loopholes, oh. um, where, where sometimes there are, are ways to uh, navigate restrictions, uh, especially regarding um, carrying from domain to domain. Um, but this was not a question of navigating the restrictions for a legitimate purpose. This was just for having something fancy on your cow. So don't fancy up your cows. <laughs> Speaking of fancying up a cow. Uh, Rabbi uh, Ben Azaria said, one may curry cattle on a festival. Uh, go ahead and do number three as well, because number one, two connects to the Rabbi Judah. And part. one may grind pepper in its own mill. All right. So 
pepper um, is something that we're used to getting out of a shaker, right? right? For most of history, that's not the way you get pepper. You get pepper by having little peppercorns and you have to grind them, right? You, you just smash them up and you can even, people actually have always had big mills to grind up the pepper. Um, nowadays, you get those little fancy pepper mills that are small, but back then, there, there were major grills for grinding up your pepper. Now, there's a problem there. The, the sages were generally more on the lenient side that said, if you just need to smash a couple peppers to get pepper for your, your, your food, that's one thing. And just, you know, smash, smash, you're okay. But a full mill, how much pepper do you need, <laughs> right? Because that means you're doing the work, not just for what you need, but that work is going to carry over. And, and that's, that's not allowed. Um, it's similar to if you were uh, on Shabbat afternoon, for example, uh, you were making a salad for yourself. And, and so you're cutting some cucumber and you've got, you know, five slices, six slices of cucumber for your salad. And you go, well, you know, I'm going to want a cucumber sandwich tomorrow too. So I'll just finish slicing the rest of the cucumber. And not allowed, right? Slicing the few for your salad today, no problem. Slicing the rest of the cucumber that you're going to use knowingly for tomorrow, not so good slicing a whole bunch of cucumber, eating two slices, and then going, you know what, I'm full. That's okay. Uh, again, coming back to what Aaron was talking about intentionality. I intended to eat it. I didn't want to waste it, but I've decided now after the fact that I'm not going to eat it, it is okay to still keep it. Um, but you can't deliberately overproduce then what you need for that moment of, of Shabbat. And, and so that was the concern. Whereas he felt that pepper was just a natural thing that needed to be prepared this way. And this was not a case of over preparation. This was just what you did. This is how you do pepper. Um, the sages disagreed. Let's come back to currying. Uh, anybody here ever been with horses? You know, you, yeah, you gotta, right? So how do you take care of a horse's um, hair? You have to comb it. Okay, so you got a comb and curry, right? So um, I really wish I had like a, I should have like the TV up here to show you a picture of a curry comb. Because a curry, because a comb, you know, we all are familiar with a comb that looks like that, right? And you definitely use a comb like that to straighten out hair and untangle it and all of that. A curry comb, um, if we look at it from the side, looks like this. And if you look at it from the top, it's usually like circles of teeth, right? It, it almost looks like a saw that's in a circle. And you use it as a very rough motion uh, on a horse to really dig underneath their, their hair and remove anything that's gotten stuck and, and bugs and, and you know splinters and all that. And it's a very deep scrubbing motion um, that you use for, for horses or, or other animals as well. Um, I, I grew up with horses, so that's what I know. And so you would use the curry comb uh, on all like their, their main hair, and then you use a regular comb like on the mane or the tail to get rid of tangles. Everyone got the, uh, the animal <laughs> uh, husbandry information? Good. I know there's lots of background information to study Mishnah. Um, so he thought currying cattle, no problem. However, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yehuda says one may not curry cattle on a festival because it may cause a wound, but one may comb them. All right. So the problem with the curry comb is if you do it wrong, you can slice the animal. Right? You can nick their skin and, and causing a wound on, on Shabbos or doing an activity that is likely to cause a wound, not allowed. Uh, so he said you're not allowed to curry, but combing, because combing doesn't injure anything, combing is allowed even on a, on a festival. We get the distinction he's making? Back to like the sweeping thing, how likely does something have to be happening? Because it's not a direct connection between combing and cutting the cow like there was right. between cutting out the chicken head. Well, it was not uncommon while currying an animal for you to put a nick in their skin. Mm -hmm. So the question of how likely does it have to be before it becomes um, prohibited is, all those who think currying is too likely, raise your hand. This was the rabbis would investigate, the rabbis would debate, and the rabbis would vote. And that which they decided was likely or unlikely became the halakha, right? So it was based off their practical experience, their observations, their logical um, disputes, and then ultimately, if they hadn't reached consensus, by a majority vote. Um, that, that's how we come to our conclusions. And then we preserve those conclusions and then use them to create new precedent 
for, for new actions and say, well, is this like currying or is this not like currying? Because we know currying is prohibited because of these issues. And that's what the Talmud then does a lot more work of. So would it be, is this like curry or would this be, is this likely to cause the same problem as curry? Both. Right, so it depends on what the the activity is. Some some activities you might say this is like currying for X, Y, and Z, and others will be it's not like currying, but it could cause the same problems as currying because of PDQ. And now we have a good debate. If you had like a safer curry comb, <laughs> would it could it now be permissible because it's less likely to cause? So injury? so this then becomes the the great question on festival and Shabbat halacha uh, of melacha of work of are there ways to do what was prohibited in ways that aren't prohibited? Right. Um, and that becomes very, very complicated uh, because the short answer is it depends. Uh, so there are some prohibitions that, that, well, I should point out, there's a distinction made in halakha between things that are prohibited de oraita and things that are prohibited de rabbana. Things that are pro prohibited de oraita uh, which is the uh, the Aramaic word for the Torah, means that it is a Torah-level prohibition. Absolutely, this is what the Torah was talking about, and if you do it, you are absolutely, undeniably breaking the commandment of the Torah. Whereas things that are prohibited to Rabbanan are, the Torah didn't expressly say, don't do this, but it is either so similar or so likely to lead to or, or so easy to, to mis, uh, misuse that the rabbis have added as a protection for the Torah prohibition. Uh, and so de Rabbanan means it's still prohibited. Sometimes there are things that you can do that avoid both de Oraita and de Rabbanan, and then it's wonderful. There's a, uh, an organization called, I think it's Somek, um, that tries to come up with various solutions to Shabbat prohibitions on usages of technology. Because um, even though, as I'm sure we've talked about before, in matters of importance, sometimes certain Shabbat prohibitions can be set aside. Saving a life is the most famous. We still try to minimize the amount of Shabbat violations we engage in. So imagine you are a doctor on Shabbat, right? You absolutely are allowed to do what is necessary to save a life but you should only do what is necessary. So this organization and others like it, try to come up with ways to minimize the, the violations. So come up with alternative ways for, um, for the, the doctors to engage with technology, to, to, to write or to make notes and other things that are not as likely to create Shabbat violations. They, they definitely say you still need to save the life, but they're trying to minimize other things. Yeah. And it's a very complicated process and not everybody agrees with the uh, conclusions that they reach. Can you, you give somebody oxycodone since you have to write the prescription? <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, that makes a big difference if you're in a lot of pain. Well, yes, it, it does make a big difference. Uh, generally speaking, uh, the question would be: Is this an immediate life-threatening condition? It's right. Just it, painful. Well, if it's if it's in quote just painful and there's no other issue that's being involved. Then, then usually we would try to find an alternative to writing the prescription. And I think if you're in a hospital setting, usually there are ways to actually prescribe it that don't require the, the prescribing physician to, to be the one writing out the, uh, the, the prescription manually, uh, him or herself. Um, but if it was necessary as part of preparation for surgery to save someone's life, I, I'm not a doctor, so please do not assume that that is what goes on. I don't know how the steps of anesthetic work of, of preparing someone for, uh, for a surgery, but I could imagine certain levels of pain relief might be needed before you get to the next level of anesthesia, um, then yes, that would be fine as a preliminary step. Uh, but then you need much more professional information, which is bringing us back to our Mishnah very briefly before we go off on another tangent, I'm sure, um, is why the rabbis actually bothered to examine the world around them. The reason we're talking about curry combs and regular combs and cracks in the floor and all of these things is because the rabbis knew the best way to explain what was and wasn't prohibited wasn't to try and come up with some perfect ideal law that could be stated as like a mathematical formula, but instead to say that not good because this, that, and that. That okay because of this, that, and that. Because those examples plus the explanations give you the information needed to tackle new situations. And, and there's no such thing as a, a perfectly clear law, law that 
explains itself, right? There's no E equals MC square for Shabbat violations. We were at shul, I was at shul a couple of years ago up north, I'm at shul, and it was Shabbos mm -hmm. afternoon, Shabbos, and as we were walking to the Oneg, one of the people keeled over on mm. the ground and fell down and was just laying there. And we said, call 911. And there was this argument in the corner. Are you allowed to make a phone call? Oh, God. <laughs> we, and we said, yes. Right. The, the Shohana Ruch actually covers, well, I mean, based off the Talmud, but it, it, it succinctly um, labels that person a pious idiot. Oh, God. If, if somebody is dying, is drowning, and you stop to ask a question about the halakha of saving them, that you are a pious idiot. Uh, it's sure. nice that you want to be righteous and all that. And of course, yes. in general, wondering whether it's allowed or not allowed on Shabbat or other issues is, is, is very important as part of Jewish spirituality. But when the person has collapsed in front of you, this is not the time to wonder, well, maybe he'll get better. Let's give it a minute. Right? <laughs> maybe we can wait till Shabbos ends and then call them. Exactly. It's, no, you, you absolutely call 911. And if yes. you if if it seems to be likely that you need to use the uh, what do they call it yeah, the, uh, the AED yes. the uh, the automatic electric defibrillator yeah. you you rip it off the wall you cut open their clothes you, you do anything that you need to do to save, to save the person's life. life and you don't ask the halakha questions mm -hmm. right after the person's been saved then you can say now if it wasn't life or death are we allowed to do that right. right could i play with the aed just for fun on shabbat you know just <laughs> i feel like having a little shock it's <laughs> I mean, I have some practice with the aed on shabbat yeah no, okay right okay. so yes yeah. I, I think in israel at least in israel i don't know here probably here too mm -hmm. uh, doctors and nurses and all these medical professionals they have a blanket permission to of course in shabbat they do because it's a life-saving Profession. Right, but blanket permission doesn't mean that you should make notes to yourself. Uh, like, let's say you're a doctor or a nurse, and, and you need to make a pa patient note, right? You know, amputate left leg so you don't cut off the wrong leg by mistake. You can't also write underneath that, buy milk, you know, tomorrow. <laughs> right. be not, not just because it would be med medically irresponsible, but the, the, the blanket permission you have only pertains to yeah. the, the job that you're doing. Um, so that that narrows it some, and there are some gray areas, and that's where these other organizations try to come up with a little bit more cushion for for handling the gray areas, which doesn't involve the shopping the list. I, I think it's called Somet. I haven't looked them up in a while. Somet, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's I think that's the name of them. I mean, they're, they're the most famous one. Uh, there, there's more you know groups that try to come up with this, but I think that's the one that I that I I think that's the name of the one that I'm thinking of. Yeah, I think they they are. Modern and they, uh, I don't know that they have a particular label, but but yeah, they they are trying to find solutions. Exactly, yeah. and and they recognize that uh, Shabbat is a very complicated network of, of prohibition and permission, and that leniency in and of itself is not bad, and strictness in and of itself isn't bad. Right, that we are called upon to observe Shabbat, and sometimes observing Shabbat in the best way. <laughs> means doing things that might look lenient <coughs> and sometimes observing Shabbat in the best way means doing things that might look strict and that's okay uh, and that's okay all right with that let's get back to uh, the sage's opinion the sage. on combing the sage's opinion was one may not curry them one may not even comb them right so this is again a slippery slope argument from the sages which is if you comb which in and of itself should be fine then you might also think that you can curry, right? Because if you're doing two steps, the, if you're doing one step of the two steps you use to take care of these animals, then you might very likely come to do the second step, which is prohibited. Uh, and, and so that that was their their precaution uh, to, to keep you from, from stepping across that line. It's sometimes important to remember that there are guardrails for a reason. Uh, even if we think we don't need them, Someone has needed them, or else there wouldn't be guardrails there. Uh, I, I like to compare it to, like, if you go to visit the Grand Canyon, don't be surprised that there's a rail before you reach the edge. Right? It, it, it's, you don't just get to walk up and stand right at the edge of, of the canyon. Uh, and also realize that the rabbis tried to put the rail in a place where you can still see the canyon. Right? They, they wanted to put that protection in a place where you still saw a, the original prohibition, they were very, very uh, aware and um, 
interested in making sure people knew what was Del Raita and what was the Rabbanan, what was strictly from the Torah and what was uh, an additional precaution from the sages. They were very, very clear about that in all cases. Um, they weren't trying to like hide it or add, you know, secretly extra things. They, they wanted it to be clear and, and very obvious to everyone. But they also wanted to make sure that the guardrail wasn't in the parking lot. You know, no, 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 just stand back 500 yards from the edge. No, that, that wasn't their idea. Because remember, backing up, backing up, backing up wasn't the goal. The goal was getting you as close where you're still safe. Because that was the line that God had given us. God didn't give us a line in the parking lot. God gave us a line at the edge of the Grand Canyon. And all we want to do is make sure no one falls in. Because that would really ruin the day. All right. For what? I'm the right. Well, it ruined your life. It ruined everyone else's day. <laughs> uh, all right. Idiot 4-1. We're going to uh, do a little bit more Shabbos festival questioning. The following cases are examples of the lenient rulings of Beit Shammai and of the rigorous rulings of Beit Hillel. Again, I know that there is the history that Beit Shammai was strict and Beit Hillel was lenient. Yes, as a general rule, that seemed to be a tendency. But... This is where they went the opposite direction. First, an egg which is laid on a festival. Beit Shammai says it may be eaten, and Beit Hillel says it may not be eaten. Okay, uh, let's see how I can how well I can explain this. Yeah. <laughs> what what's the issue, right? What's so, the issue? the the issue as we already talked about. Well, let me back up. What the issue isn't is an issue of of eating an egg, right? We already talked about you're allowed to cook on a festival for the festival. That's no problem. If I've got an egg just sitting in my, my basket of eggs, uh, remember no refrigerators back then, I am certainly allowed to eat that egg on a festival day. No problem, everybody agrees. Let's- it's a new production. Ah, it's not That's just that it's new, it's that it was an unprepared pro production, right? So- And was created on Shabbat. Okay? That that's that that's that's almost a, that's almost a side effect of why it is unprepared. So in in Jewish law, there's a category of objects known as muktzah, uh, and muktzah is really complicated and, and covers a lot of different issues. But 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 muktzah, generally speaking, and we're going to get a few examples here, means that it's an item that in and of itself is perfectly fine, but because of its current status you're not allowed to use or sometimes even like move on Shabbat itself, right? So what would need to prevent an object that normally you could use, like an egg, what would prevent you from using it? Well, if the egg didn't exist before Shabbat existed, there's no way for you to have mentally thought, I'm going to need that egg. Um, I'm trying to give you a, a modern example because most of us don't raise chickens um and obviously we can't harvest on shabbat so even if you have like a vegetable garden it doesn't doesn't uh, doesn't work um EBR. ah male right male um so uh, imagine you are living in one of those houses where they actually have a mail slot right not a mailbox but a little thing. so there's no question of bringing things from one domain to another because the mailman did that for you and you had no control over what he was doing because you didn't ask him to it's just what he does um so you're sitting in your house and all of a sudden, bam, mail comes through, right? Now, there's nothing wrong with reading a letter or, or let's call it a newspaper even, right? There's nothing wrong with reading a newspaper, right? But you need to open. Uh, it depends, I mean, nowadays it's a little more complicated than a rubber band in the old days. Uh, at least I think, I don't read physical newspapers anymore. Um, I guess hardly anyone does. Um, we, got, we, got one, we got one over here, one devotee. So, it's not, the, it's not the best example because there are ways to actually read the newspaper, non-digital and, and physical on, on Shabbat. But let, let's imagine for a moment you get something else that normally would be fine on Shabbat, but because it has just sort of boop, popped into existence, you were not planning to read this on Shabbat, right? You did not mentally reserve a spot in Shabbat for this object. And therefore, that object is now classified as muktzah, and on Shabbat, you can't use it. Well, an egg is rather spontaneous, right? It, whether you get an egg or not uh, is, is kind of luck. And, and so you couldn't be sitting there saying, the egg inside that chicken is gonna come out on Shabbat and I'm gonna eat it in the afternoon. You can't predict imaginary eggs. Right? It, it, so therefore the egg is a, boop, it popped out of existence. It doesn't have a spot in your mind in this Shabbat. 
therefore you can't eat that egg. Says Beit Hillel, Beit Shammai says, no, it's fine, eggs are eggs, right? And, and just because the egg appeared on Shabbat doesn't mean that the egg wasn't part of the chicken, which you did have kind of in mind would be around on Shabbat. It's not like the chicken appeared out of nowhere. So therefore the egg would be allowed. Um, but Beit Hillel, of course, wins the argument in the end. But this is just an example where Beit Shammai was more lenient than Beit Hillel on the same topic. And that is just the barest minimum of, of what Muktz is about. Um, and I'm sure we'll come across other examples, um, but it, it gets more complicated from there. Um, okay, part two. Are we talking about eating yeast? Uh, no, no. Well, I'll, I'll explain okay. as you read it. Because Beit Shammai says, yeast as much as an olive in quantity, and leavened food as much as a date, and Beit Hillel says, as much as an olive in quantity in both cases. All right, Pesach, <laughs> right? During Passover, we all know there's a prohibition on eating leavened products, but there's also a prohibition on having them in your property, in your possession, right? Oh. Making, having them be your property. How much quantity do you have to worry about? Well, there's two different measures. Uh, at least that's what, that there's two different mentions in, in Torah. And Beit Shammai says, therefore, there are two different measures. And Beit Hillel says, no, it's the same measure for both. One of them is what we're most familiar with, which is, le which, which is uh, bread, right? Something that was leavened, that was allowed to rise, and then it was cooked. That is, is what he means by when he says leavened food. The yeast is not actually the best word for it. Uh, it's the, um, what do you call it, uh, seor. Uh, it's the, in, in the old world, um, most people made bread the way we make sourdough bread now. Um, does anyone here know how to make sourdough bread? Oh, man, got no bakers. It, it's great. Judy Chisby's at the Lunch and Learn. She is a great baker, and she uh, was able to explain a lot about some of these yeast questions. But from what, uh, from the way it works, and I've never made sourdough, but I know how it works because I've studied Mishnah. <laughs> the way it works is you have a ball of dough that you keep week after week after week. It's called your starter dough. And that dough has been gathering the wild yeast that just exists all around us. Yeah, I know, kind of weird. Uh, and that wild yeast cultures and grows in the dough. And when you make a new dough, you pull off some of it you use it in the new one, and then you take a bit of that dough and stick it back into the old one, and it just keeps churning and churning and churning and making yeast and yeast and yeast. That's the process that makes sourdough sour. Um, in the old world, no one had neat little yeast packets. No one had jars of yeast. The, 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 the yeast that you had grown was the yeast in your little bundle of, of sourdough-ish goo that you would keep for an entire year wow. until Passover came along. When Passover came along, it's got to go bye-bye, right? It, it has to be disposed of because you're not allowed to own that giant fermenting yeast ball. Um, but when you're cleaning up and you're worried about finding the little bits of starter yeast or starter dough that are left around your house, how small do you have to worry about? And that's what the argument is here. So Beit Hillel says an olive size for both. Right. If you find an olive-sized piece of toast, and if you find an olive-sized piece of starter dough, they have to go. If it's smaller than that, don't kill yourself. Right. It is. It is legally insignificant if it is less than that size. Does that make sense? Right. And Beit, uh, Beit Shammai says that for the um, uh, for the yeast, yes, it's only the olive size because it's more potent, I guess you'd say. But for the leavened food, it would be the larger size of a date. Um, so a, a slightly larger crumb of toast would be okay than compared to what Beit Hillel thinks. Make sense? Good. By the way, this basic principle that only an olive size or larger is uh, legally significant on Pesach is a very important part of how you prepare with, for Pesach without going crazy and needing a magnifying glass. Because uh, if you can't see it with your eye, it is not legally significant. All right, uh, I think we've got time for 4-2, which is going to be a little bit of a continuation of that egg question. A beast which was born on a festival, all agree that it is permitted, and a chicken which was hatched from the egg, all agree that it is forbidden. Okay, so this is going to sound a little weird. If you've got a cow, 
and the cow is pregnant. And it's a regular like weekday. Um, so forget for the festival for the moment. And you decide you would like to eat that cow and you slaughter that cow. What do you do with the now dying baby inside of the cow? It's a trait. Nope. It is not only uh, allowed to be eaten, you do not even need to shecht it, mm. right? You don't even have to do shechita for the cow, for the baby cow, right? Does it die naturally? No, because, because it was because it was included. Oh, because it was included in the mother. When you slaughtered the mother, you slaughtered her whole body, including the part that was inside of her, right? So th th there are parallels in this. In case you're wondering, to to the modern debate about abortion. Um, but this is one of the, the ways that we know that the, the child is considered to be part of the mother until it leaves the mother. And so the, the slaughtered mother, the slaughtering of the mother also makes the cow, the calf kosher. Uh, and this again can be rather shocking to people to realize yeah. that you would be allowed to, to just take that cow and strangle it if you wanted it and, and eat it after that point. It's crazy, but yes, that, that baby cow from inside the mother is considered to be slaughtered if you slaughtered the mother, as long as it was in the cow, right? You don't get to, you don't know, no, it came out of the cow, it's on its own, and you got to follow the rules for itself. Question? Isn't there, isn't there a split on that within the Jewish community on, on back to the abortion thing? Uh, uh, the abortion there has become, unfortunately, rather politicized um, because the lines that were drawn in the American political landscape are very different than the lines that are drawn within Jewish law. And so you end up with people on both sides of the American political landscape, rightly pointing to aspects of Jewish law that justify part of their position. Uh, but no, no American political party has a platform that fits Jewish law precisely, um, which is why the, the most common position under uh, many, Jewish, um, uh, many Jewish scholars is to say, the government should stay out of the question of abortion and people should talk to their rabbi before they have an abortion to find out what is and isn't permitted according to Jewish law, um, rather than having the government make that decision for us, because that would be an intrusion on our definition uh, and our practice of our religion. I, I thought I heard a lot of the Orthodox people say that abortion is prohibited within the Orthodox. And as a general rule, Judaism never encourages or, or celebrates abortion. Um, and as a general rule, all communities know that there are numerous numerous moments when abortion is the correct answer. Uh, but the exact particulars of each woman's um, situation are, are necessary to be understood in the Jewish world. Um, whereas most people in the broad political spectrum want to talk in broad generalities. And that's what drives us crazy as, as Jewish people, because we deal in particulars. We don't deal with just talking points and, and sound bites. Um, but that's enough about abortion for today. Because on this, this says a beast which was born on a festival. Okay, what so, you seem to be talking about is any time Okay, was born. so I wanted to make sure you understood that the beast is considered to be linked to the mother, right? So that that you need to have that viscerally understand uh, understanding for the next part to make sense. So if, remember, we, we were worried about an egg being born, uh, laid on, on, on a festival, why is it that we're allowed to say the beast is uh, allowed on the festival? Because the mother had a reserved spot and the baby cow was part of the mother. Therefore, it too has a reserved spot in our mind for the festival. So it doesn't count as moksa. And so therefore, I am allowed to slaughter it and eat it. Whereas an egg, right, that is sitting there just getting warm and warm and warm until it hatches, that's not part of the mother. It is completely separate. The mother may be sitting on it and warming it and all of that, but it is a separate thing. And therefore it, the, the chick inside the egg is not part of the mother. So when it hatches, everybody agrees, you don't get to eat that today, right? You have to, you have to wait. Make sense? Okay. Part two gets a little bit bloodier. <laughs> He who slaughters a wild animal or a bird on a festival. Okay, very important part of wild animals and, and birds is when you drain out their blood, it has to be covered with dirt. Right? Wild animals, by the way, are things like deer. Uh, deer is kosher. Uh, we don't kill deer by hunting, but we can trap deer and then you can shecht it uh, in the normal 
manner of, of, of slaughter. Um, but when you drain out the blood, you have to cover it with earth. You have to put dirt on it. For a particular period of time? Uh, no, just, just when you yeah. are draining the blood. Oh, right. Well, yeah. the, the, the blood, yeah. When the, when the blood is, you hang it upside down, the blood falls out, and, and you put dirt over the top of, of the blood. Oh. Of the blood, not of the animal. Oh, the animal you're going to eat. Yeah. <laughs> right, you cover the blood. Why? Because the Torah told the us Torah. to. <laughs> Uh, we can go into why the Torah told us to maybe another time, but this is already a long enough tangent. Um, so the Torah says that this is what we do for um, the uh, for for these animals, uh, and, and that is one that is, is just part of the halakha. So the question becomes: Is that Devar? Is it Devarim or is it Bamidvar? I have to go check. Um, sorry, it's it's not one that I have to do often in my life. No, no. <laughs> um, so, I think it's one of the readings for the holidays. Shavuot, Sukkot. Could be. Uh, when he talks about uh, uh, Gedi, that is yeah. uh, well, the newborn. Is yeah. Born, newborn. Uh, you can, uh, yeah, if if you slaughter it. Or any animal that hmm. is kosher, you slaughter it. You have to get rid of the blood because the blood is. But you have no getting rid of the blood. Yes, but this is the not that this is not about removing the blood. This is about covering the blood, right? Removing the blood is easy, and you can and you could do that on a festival, no problem. And everybody agrees that's part of what you do to prepare an animal to eat it and make it kosher. However, the dirt, that's called digging, right? So now we have a question of. With an animal whose blood I don't have to cover, that's fine. But for an animal whose blood I do have to cover, how am I going to dig on the festival to be able to have the dirt to cover? Remember, this is only a festival because we wouldn't be slaughtering on Shabbat. Okay, so, so Shammai, with that in mind. <laughs> Shammai says, he may dig with a pronged tool and cover up the blood. But Beth Hillel says, he may not slaughter it unless he had the earth made ready. Right. So Beit Shammai's position is if you dig in a different way, uh, and actually in other uh, commentaries, the idea is if you have a, um, a, a, a implement already in the ground and all you have to do is pull it up and, and it will bring some earth with it, then that would be okay. Because right? it's not really digging. It's maybe at best half the act of digging because it was already sort of there. And Beit, Shil Beit Hillel says, no, <laughs> if you've got a bucket of dirt ready, then sure, that's okay. But if you have to do anything with the ground, then don't slaughter it. Uh, and that is the key point, is you don't slaughter it if you're at that point, right? You shouldn't slaughter it because you can't cover it. But... They agree that if he did slaughter it... Which he basically means they both agree that if he didn't ask and went ahead and slaughtered it anyway, then regardless of who, who he's talking to, Beit Hillel or Beit Shammai, the following is the procedure. Then he should dig with a pronged tool and cover up the blood and that the ashes of a stove count as being prepared for the holiday. All right, so the ashes are, is a slightly different question uh, and more about Muktzah, that even though the ashes didn't exist because the ashes are what are burning down, um, the ashes are still considered prepared for the holiday. But to our blood question, they're basically saying, if he went ahead and slaughtered it on a festival, he has a mitzvah to cover the blood, right? That, that's not an option. Now, Beit Hillel says, you shouldn't slaughter it. But if you already had, right, what we call bideavad, after the fact, the, rather than, you know, lahatchila, uh, before you did it, but right? if you did it after the fact, then yes, after you've slaughtered it, you can use this prong tool to go ahead and, and take a pseudo dig a, in order to cover the earth. And that would be the correct compromise position. But in general, you just shouldn't be slaughtering, says Beit, uh, Beit Hillel. Make sense? Yes, the covering of the blood, I think, if I remember correctly, the blood is considered the uh, life. Well, yes, I mean, actually, that was something we discussed. Like burying, like burying the life. Kind of. I mean, that was something we discussed in today's um, Lunch and Learn for, for Parashat Bo, you know, the nefesh tachat nefesh, the idea that the, that the, 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 the dam has the nefesh, the blood has the life uh, of the animal uh, and of humans as well. The Torah say you have to live 
the uh, the blow run it like a, like a water can. Exactly, yeah. and let it and let it drain out. Exactly. That well, that's how you yeah, slaughter it. You <laughs> exactly. Right. That because because the blood has the life of the animal, we don't get to eat it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and and uh, for these animals, we have to not only drain it but also cover it. Uh, which yes, you're, you're right. It's similar to kavuras, similar to burial, similar to burial. Um, but but not not exactly. <laughs> All right. With that, huh, we've been down many different paths, and uh, we will call it. They talk about a pronged tool. Mm -hmm. Are they somehow?